Very nice to see you all around Friday afternoon. I know the temptation is big. Sunshine is very tempting. Weekend is close. So we have this data protection panel uh, as the last panel on this conference, which will be followed by closing speech by uh, Professor uh, Chefalvay. So what we are going to talk about, this is privacy, this is data protection or data privacy as you wish. So during this panel, we are going very, very personal. So if we talk about data protection, then we talk about very, very intimate things. Things you would not want to see online. You don't want to be shared with uh, others, with those who don't have a business in that. So I suggest that when talking about data privacy or data protection, then think about your secrets. What you would not share, what you don't want to see uh, online. Uh, when teaching at university, I always start with a question. Of course, this is an open question, but I always start with that. Whether we still have the privacy, the illusion of privacy, or we have completely lost it. This is a question. Of course, there's no need to answer it during the panel. This is an open question. But for yourself, please uh, think about it, and uh, maybe you will get an answer uh, to this. And I always tell the story uh, for the memory of my grandmother, who, lives, by the way, used to live in this uh, neighborhood, just a couple of hundred of, of meter away uh, from this venue. And uh, when she loved politics. She was a homo, homo politicus. Uh, she was always available to speak about public matters and politics and politicians, whatever, in this field. And she had a habit. Whenever we started to talk about politics, she went to the window, closed it firmly, and then she went to, back to her armchair. And then she was safe. Now we can talk. No one listens. Uh, I envied her because she had the illusion of privacy. She, was, she believed that no one is listening. So uh, this is the question to everyone uh, in this room, whether we still have this illusion of privacy. Maybe we have lost privacy. It's gone. Maybe. This is an answer. This is a possible answer. There is a possi another, another possible answer is that uh, privacy is still there, but we don't have the illusion, or the vi vice versa. We have lost privacy, but as a good citizen, we would like to keep the illusion of privacy. Or the worst case scenario that we have lost privacy as such and we have lost even the illusion. But we would like to get it back. And basically, let's take a positive approach. This is what we are talking about here today. That was my very personal introduction, but I, I like doing that because it points uh, to the questions, to the dilemmas we are dealing with when talking about uh, data protection. Okay, let's go back to our old topic, platforms. And we have a great panel here for experts from Hungary and outside Hungary. And I would like to invite uh, our first speaker, Zsolt Zödi, who is uh, Lecturer, he used to work previously in his career for a publishing company, and he's a senior research fellow in University of uh, Public Service. By the way, we are colleagues there. Yep. Uh, I'm also a fellow researcher there. Uh, his field of interest covers uh, a lot of uh, subject matters. I will quote here, regulatory problems of information society, particularly platforms and artificial intelligence, quantitative research, public sector information reuse, and open government data, plus law and language uh, studies. I think fair enough. Jolt, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, 
presentation will be a little bit uh, more broad or philosophical on, 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 a, on an abstraction, higher abstraction level, because it will be about, and that, therefore, that's why I think you've selected as a first, uh, first presentation. This will be about the crisis of traditional data protection, so kind of <laughs> uh, 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 not, not very uh, uh, traditional uh, way of starting something, uh, start, starting a panel of data protection about the crisis of the data protection, that's, uh, that sounds weird. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is that how do, not just the platforms, but some new phenomena uh, caused the crisis of uh, data, data protection. Uh, to start with that, what is the paradigm of the, the, the paradigm of, of this traditional data protection? This, uh, this kind of, or this notion of this approach of data protection was created, was or was born in the in the 80s, and its ultimate goal is to protect uh, uh, to protect the individual uh, or, or for, about the, or from the tyranny uh, of of big uh, of, of the state or big companies that can oppress or even destroy, or can dis even destroy uh, the, the, uh, this subject uh, based on the data. This is based also on the sharp separation of personal data and other data. Uh, and there's this philosophical notion that, uh, that the, the individual must be uh, as opaque as possible, while the state uh, should be as transparent as possible. Uh, there must be a verifiable purpose, uh, uh, and this purpose is a central notion within the traditional data protection because it limits everything. Uh, the collection of the data, the time, the method, uh, how it is collected, how it is stored, what is it used for. So the, the central notion, one of the central notion of this uh, traditional data protection is that the, the purpose and the limitation of the purpose is, is, a, is a very important uh, here. Uh, this. Uh, the, uh, the other uh, central notion is the informed consent notion, that the, uh, that the data subject has, has to have a no uh, a consent on, uh, and it, 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 must be a, it must be a process, a very transparent process, and uh, uh, that how it is collected and what is collected. So it is very, very important. That's the second uh, central notion. Uh, and this presupposes, or the idea behind the, this whole thing is that if we protect the data, we will protect the people. So the people against the tyranny or against the, against the, uh, uh, the abuse of, of, uh, of their data. And uh, this, the traditional uh, uh, yeah, regulatory environment of the, of the data protection is that we have the personal data and other data, and the personal data is protected by the data protection law, and non-personal data Actually, it is not perceived as data. That's, that's I think, a very important, uh, important uh, uh, point here, is that we have, we have data everywhere, but actually it is not called as data according to the, or uh, under the, the, the traditional uh, uh, regulation. It is called uh, work in copyright law. It is uh, 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 called a database in the data, database protection law. It is uh, called a trade secret or secret. Uh, it is called uh, public sector information under the, the, the previous or the old public sector information 2003 uh, um, directive. So it is all data, but actually it is not called data and it is not perceived as data and it is not regulated as data. It is regulated with different, uh, different tools and different, uh, different means. Um, so what, what happened uh, after, the, after, the, uh, after the emergence of internet? Because the whole story or the crisis of the traditional data protection starts with the emergence of the internet. I think the first thing what happened when internet, uh, internet was born, that actually the, 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 uh, with e-commerce and of course uh, e-government initiatives as, a, as well, is that the remote storing of data started. That the data subjects give, gave the data to uh, in, a, in a way that it was stored somewhere else in servers, and also that they were, uh, these data were, was traced by cookies. So if I visit a website, uh, I'm, I'm leaving my data there, uh, not deliberately, but it is, it, is, it is there, and it is just collected, uh, and I don't know what is collected. So therefore, that was the first change. But uh, uh, 
the, the other, uh, uh, I, I think, milestone in this, in this development is the, uh, around 2000, where the emergence and, uh, of the platforms, of course, platforms were before uh, 2010, but after the 2008 crisis, these platforms uh, uh, were strengthened enormously. Uh, uh, and uh, with the platforms, uh, a new phenomena uh, 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 was born, uh, and it is very important uh, from, from this viewpoint, and this is the, this is the, this is the uh, mass data collection and uh, and uh, uh, micro targeting uh, uh, of uh, of and uh, and the profiling and the micro targeting of the data subjects. That's this this is a new phenomena which was which was born with the with the platforms. And finally, in mid uh, in uh, 2010. So a few years ago, five, so five, six, seven years ago, the big data narrative emerged, and also uh, together with the, the artificial, artificial intelligence and the machine learning as uh, as a phenomena emerged, uh, and with this. Uh, 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 I, I forgot to mention that uh, together with the platforms, the data economy as a notion was born also. This is a new, new something. And in the mid, uh, 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 a few years later, with, together with the machine learning and together with the artificial in intelligence, the data governance as a notion was born. So, new things, uh, micro-targeting, profiling, collection of data uh, in amounts that was that was uh, unimaginable uh, before because uh, platforms are collecting i don't know no one knows that but there are some guessings that 29 to 30 52 uh, thousand data points from one uh, data subject so this is something this is something very new and this uh, uh, just uh, just uh, uh, one one thing is that yeah, no one knows that how many data points are collected by the by the uh, by the platforms. This is all done by consent, theoretically. Uh, this means that there is uh, continuous surveillance. Uh, this means that behavioral data is also collected, so not just data that is that is given by the uh, uh, by the by the data subject, but all data what he is doing on that particular website is collected. So behavioral data, there is micro profiling. So it is not that the big companies had the profile like they 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 created profiles of 10, 20. I worked for such a company, so I know that the, the, we, we had something like 10 profiles or 15 profiles of, the, of our customers. This is not true anymore because this is micro profiling. Uh, uh, um, uh, social media site can uh, or a service can have millions of profiles of the customers, so micro profiling, and also micro targeting based on this micro profiling. So they are targeting these customers uh, in the, more or less individually or nearly individually, they can target that. And that's again a new development that they can target it in in in, in fields which was which was before not the case, like in political matters, which is a new phenomena because they were targeted before because of commercial uh, uh, purposes, but now they are targeted targeted uh, with political messages. So this means that data has become not a complementary resource of a business activity, but data uh, is the main source of the business activity. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm, I'm always saying that, that this, there is a saying in the, uh, 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 amongst the developers that what is, what is the bug and what is the, what is the feature. So micro-targeting uh, uh, and this behavioral marketing is not sometimes perceived by the data protection, data protection professionals that this is a kind of bug in, the, in, in social media, but this is not a bug, this is a feature of the system. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, it has caused also some new developments, like they, uh, this is extremely data intensive. They need a lot, lot of training data. Uh, it, can, it can reveal hidden connections, which we don't know. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, the, the machine learning systems uh, enable to have, uh, uh, they are capable of manipulation. They are capable of prediction, which is a new, oh, again, a new development uh, on the basis of the old type of data uh, processing. It was, it, was, uh, it was not possible to make predictions. Now you can make uh, very good predictions. Uh, the decisions are very difficult to explain. Explainability become, became the, 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 the crucial problem with the machine learning and their operations are not transparent. So what, <clears throat> how the traditional data protection reacted to all these problems, this is a, this is a, Matias de Purtova wrote an article about the, that the data, data protection law is the law of everything now. 
to put it very simply, uh, it reacted with uh, with uh, with a very conserv in a very conservative way. Uh, uh, to, to uh, long story short, <laughs> is that with fines, with punishments. So the uh, traditional data protection is now its its reaction is that it tr it is it is it is punishing the social media and fining the social media all the time. You can you can hardly find uh, data protection authority in the in in Europe which has not fined a social media company. So fines, it, the, the, and these fines are increasing all the time, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it's, of course, uh, uh, and it's, of course, uh, uh, really will not, uh, it, it is not changing the behavior of the social media. So uh, that's, that's uh, uh, ultimately the, the result. Uh, but she, wrote, she writes that as our environment is rapidly approaching what someone called off, off all life, where our daily existence is mediated by information technology, everything in this environment, whether wasteway, et cetera, is being increasingly dat datafied, and literally any data can be plausibly argued to be personal. That the, and the problem is that in the circumstances where all the data is personal and triggers data protection, a highly intensive and non-scalable regime of rights and obligations that result from the GDPR cannot be upheld in a meaningful way. That's, his, that's, his, uh, that's her conclusion. Uh, and, and I think that this uh, practice of, of uh, imposing uh, bigger and bigger fines, while uh, it has no result or no, no visible result, that's, uh, that, that shows something uh, from this crisis. And we can see uh, the dawn of a new paradigm because there are legal tools and legal instruments that are approaching the data from a different angle. So it is not just the data protection which uses the notion of data, but we can see here that this regulation uses the, on the free uh, framework for the free flow of non-personal data in the European Union. Also, uh, this is an interesting directive because it, it, it is, it is, uh, it is using, so you can use your personal data for payment, that's basically the, the idea behind the, or one of the one of the articles is, is, is talking about that. Uh, but the Data Governance Act, uh, artificial intelligence proposal, approaches the data from totally different angle as the data protection, as a traditional data protection, and also the Data Act proposal. So a new parad paradigm uh, uh, is now uh, uh, emerging, and this paradigm is the so to say the other extreme that data is everything and everything is data. We can see data everywhere. This is, this, this is sometimes uh, quite ridiculous because, because, yes, of course, you can perceive the, everything as data, but, uh, but this, is an, this, is, this is an other extreme. But uh, it's there, it's, it's our reality. So as we spend more and more time in the virtual world and compute everything with machines, everything seems to be data. So all traditional legal relations can be perceived or defined or interpreted as data and as data creation, data processing, data connection, data relation, data destroying, data interpretation, whatever. And law seems to embrace this attitude because more and more rules, as we've seen, created on different aspects of data management, data collection, data flow, and data value. And it's, it has an, a, a huge impact on every field of law. That is why the data protection law becomes uh, the law of everything. So that's why uh, that, that this is the thing what uh, Putova recognized. Uh, and the question is that if data is everything, shall we really, I mean, uh, extend the data protection rules uh, to everything? Or we, if extend these rules to everything, then what will happen with the, those ins legal instruments that has been uh, already created? So the question is that, what is the relationship with this new notion that data is everything and there's data governance and we should manage the data and there's data economy and data is a resource, so we have to use it as a resource and data is a competitive advantage and data is essential for Europe because we have to, have to we are competing with China and the US. So the question is, to put it very simply, what is the relationship between the old traditional data protection uh, approach and this new approach? And what, what could be the solution? So there are certain solutions to, to 
overcome or to, to create a more modern uh, uh, attitude, and I'm just mentioning a few of them. One is Jack Balkin, who says that, okay, then let's take the uh, uh, social media as information fiduciaries, which means that the law should treat digital companies that, that collect and use the end uh, user data according to fiduciary principles, like, the, like an attorney or, a, or an accountant. Uh, so they are trusted, uh, this data is trusted to them, and then they have to handle it as, as an attorney the, the secrets of, of uh, his or her client. The other uh, approach is the data ownership approach, that data should be, uh, um, should be the subject uh, uh, of property. So data can be the property of someone, which, is, which has a, it's, it sounds like a plausible, uh, plausible notion or, or an idea, but actually it has very, very serious implications. It can ruin the whole data protection law, because the data protection law is based on this dignity concept that, okay, and, and human rights concept. So if we turn the data into a property, uh, then that changes everything. So, but this is, this is raised uh, 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 in many places and in the literature as well. Can the data be a kind of uh, personal data as a kind of copyright? So if someone uses the data, this is, this is the idea behind this idea is a very simple notion or very simple, very simple uh, uh, thought that, okay, if I give my data to a company and it uses, then, uh, then I could get, uh, uh, get back money from, from this use. Uh, uh, as, 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 the, uh, as if I, my work is used by a company or my copyright, after my copyright I'm getting, I'm getting money. So a special agency uh, should be enacted that, uh, which is, which is uh, dealing with, the, with this data as a trusted data manager. Or there is an idea that special algorithms should protect us, that we should have a kind of special, special uh, software that is protecting uh, protecting us in the in the in the uh, online uh, space, but still there are some questions and dilemmas. And the first one is that what will this new paradigm system look like in its final form? So there there are new uh, laws and there are new uh, instruments that are that are uh, uh, that was uh, created as this like this new approach as the representatives of this new approach that data is everywhere. But how this new system will look like, because it seems that it is just, it is just emerging. It is now just, the whole uh, thing is just starting now. And uh, the question which I raised already is that what will be the relationship between the traditional data protection and the new, uh, any kind of new data protection or data management system? Uh, because now the situation is, and it was put by Christian van der Horst, is that the obvious tension between data protection on the one hand and the data economy on the other is solved by now evading the question. So that's, that's now the solution that we don't, don't, solve the, don't solve the, but somehow we have to solve the problem. Somehow we have to define the relationship between the old traditional data protection and the new, this new notion or new approach or paradigm. How will the consistency and coherence be established concerning legal provisions regulating the data? Because there is a tension. Now data sometimes perceived as a property, now as a resource, and sometimes it is, it is, uh, it is perceived uh, or approached as, as a kind of, uh, which is a part of our human rights. Uh, and finally, that, that's not a data protection question, but still a question that how can Europe be competitive against China and the US without such a coherent approach towards data? Because we can say, as we say now, okay, this is depending on the context. So we perceive data depending on the context. In some context it is property, in some context it is, it is a human right or connected to our human right, it's, it's a dignity-based something, but it's, since it's not coherent, this is not, a, this is not a, a viable, I think it, this is not a viable solution. So these are, these are the dilemmas and the questions and I, I think we're gonna have a, a discussion uh, based on that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation and uh, especially for the very clear language you used. Even if it is about the crisis, we have to be clear uh, that's uh, not going uh, to the same direction, to the right direction. Uh, I suggest that we go on with the presentations and at the end of the row we will have the questions and we will answer, uh, hopefully answer, all the questions uh, that are going to uh, arrive. 
Okay, uh, our next speaker is Martin uh, Domokos. I will present him uh, briefly. He's uh, a lawyer. He's uh, a senior counsel in the commercial team at uh, CMS uh, Budapest. He is very much into uh, technology regulations. Um, we often encounter at events where technology is being discussed. Uh, uh, he is uh, the president of the Data Protection Board of the Direct, Market, Direct and Interactive, Mar Interactive Marketing Association, a FEDMA member. Uh, he uh, pursued several secondments during his uh, career and uh, studied, also studied in this uh, field in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think that's the brief introduction, <laughs> and I will give uh, the floor at this point to you. Thank you very much. So I think I will continue with the, with the same topic because uh, I'm also focusing on the new challenges, just like Jean did. So uh, let's just jump into the new laws because laws uh, should reflect to those challenges. I will talk about briefly uh, four new laws, DMA and DSA. I think you heard about it a lot uh, in the last two days. I will also talk about the Data Governance Act and uh, then about the new AI Act. So, as you are aware, uh, DSA is a very, very new concept, and uh, I will focus on the part which relates to data processing. Jod said that everything is data, and in my mind, everything is data processing. Mm -hmm. For example, if we took the new provisions from the DSA, we can see, first and foremost, that it doesn't define illegal content. It should regulate the removal of illegal content, but it leaves the definition to the nations and the national authorities. And that's the first challenge that it will bring, because what is illegal content? That's very specific on the circumstances of the particular country, on its uh, ethics standards, on its democratic standards. And data protection authorities may have their say how to define illegal content. Then, if we have defined illegal content, then we have uh, obligations for flagging, removal, establishing internal complaint handling system, etc. Again, that entails the processing of personal data. Not new concepts, not new ways, but new internal procedures for companies. Not just an average GDPR mechanism where the company makes a privacy notice for its applicants, employees, third parties. It's a more sophisticated data processing operation, so GDPR compliance is a must. Then there's risk management. GDPR also recognizes risk management, especially in the field of data protection impact assessments. DSA also mentions risk management mechanisms, and uh, these mechanisms live in parallel with the risk mechanisms under the GDPR. So probably data protection impact assessments will become wider and they will entail not just data protection impact, but uh, other legal impacts as well. And the other rules, content moderation, the use of algorithms. Again, I reflect to Jean's presentation because he expressly mentioned the use of algorithms. That also entail data processing and GDPR compliance. Then another topic in the DSA is online advertising, uh, targeting, profiling. Well, that's classic GDPR stuff. Uh, it's the restrictions uh, which are rather new. And to enforce these restrictions in the data processing, the company or the organization must process personal data itself. Because if they want to fulfill these obligations, they must review the data processing operations, they must uh, filter their databases, which are used for advertisement. Again, that's a new type of data processing operation, which is introduced by the DSA. And uh, a final topic, which I find very interesting and challenging, what will the authorities do? In the last, I would say in the last decade, authorities were rather separate. There is a data protection authority, there is a competition authority, there is a media authority. And now, the laws interplay, so the authorities must play together. 
And if there is an authority that is enforcing the DSA and uh, data processing comes into the picture, then it must interact with the other authorities, especially data protection authorities. So no matter that there will be a new authority, the DSA says the Digital Services co uh, Coordinator. I truly believe that competition authorities, media authorities, and data protection authorities will also have their say in the DSA on a local level. That requires uh, resources. That's just a uh, uh, thought for, Andra, for the, the roundtable discussion, because I think it, it would be essential to deal with this. We have a preparation time for the DSA, but uh, as we have seen it in case of the GDPR, uh, you cannot have a, a enough time to prepare, and authorities uh, must prepare too. The second big law which is uh, upcoming is the DMA. Uh, I'm sure you heard about it a lot in the last, last two days. And the uh, DMA, even it concerns markets, it also relates to data processing. For example, DMA defines these core platform services. If we check the list of these services, these are data-based services. They use personal data, non-personal data. So if someone wants to comply with the DMA, this compliance mechanism must go together with the compliance mechanism under the GDPR. If we check the express list of obligations, which are brought uh, by the DMA, we can see that there's a prohibition of data combination, uh, there is communication with end users, uh, prohibitions on uh, advertising or uh, interoperability rules. These are technical measures, data processing measures. So if someone wants to comply with the DMA, then data processing and GDPR compliance is, is very, very essential. So that's what I want to emphasize, that all these things go together. An organization cannot say that I'm establishing a mechanism for DSA compliance or DMA compliance. It must go together with the other procedures of the company as well, and it must particularly consider the data set the company has. And again, it is important to deal with authorities because uh, even if compliance monitoring is the responsibility of the commission in case of the DMA, and uh, I had a very, very interesting uh, uh, discussion before the, the presentation that uh, it is widely known that the, the commission is hiring a lot of people to uh, be there and enforce DMA. Again, I think that the role of the national authorities will be inevitable and uh, there must be a, a cooperation mechanism between the authorities and the authorities themselves and between the authorities and the commission as well. Uh, as we can see from GDPR enforcement, uh, that can be a challenge. Again, that requires uh, communication and, and resources. And uh, there are some uh, reasonable criticism of the GDPR that enforcement mechanisms are uh, a little bit slow. Uh, Cross-border enforcement is a little bit slow. And uh, it's clear that the stakeholders want to see that if we have an EU-wide law, then the enforcement must be EU-wide as well, and such enforcement must be, must be smooth. So that's a, that was a challenge for GDPR. That will be a challenge for the DMA, and the authorities must uh, deal with that. The third law that I, I wanted to briefly talk about is the Data Governance Act. And uh, the Data Governance Act is uh, uh, I would say interesting, I don't know if it's the right word. So Jot already mentioned that the concepts of uh, data are changing. And the Data Governance Act is a perfect example for that, that we are shifting from the traditional definition of personal data. We are shifting away from the traditional concepts of data processing and data protection obligations. And uh, there are new data categories, for example, the DGA says that there's a data category held by public sector bodies. Uh, there are new type of data, uh, data uses, like for non-commercial uh, purposes. There is a new notification and supervisory framework. 
uh, not just the, the classic supervisory framework that we, we saw at media authorities or data protection authorities or competition authorities. Data governance act is a, it's a whole new thing. Uh, there's voluntary registration for uh, organizations who are, are processing data for the so-called altruistic purposes. Uh, again, a brand new concept. And we will have a, a so-called data innovation board as well. Why the data innovation board is important? Because again, it will exist in a, uh, the existing system. So in parallel with the local authorities, in parallel with the European Data Protection Board. And I think it's uh, inevitable that these bodies should talk to each other. And uh, if they issue a guidance or a statement, uh, it must interact with the other authorities' uh, guidelines. Otherwise, uh, the regulatory environment will not be uh, predictive for the stakeholders, and uh, it can cause um, competitive problems for the EU. And uh, what is important to emphasize in the DGA, that uh, there, are, there are certain goals that require data processing and data sharing. So as I said, data, data processing is everything. And the DGA is introducing these brand new concepts like uh, facilitation of data sharing uh, in the public sector, uh, facilitating and encouraging individuals and businesses to share personal data. It is necessary to establish a, a trusted framework for this data sharing. And uh, there's the concept of, of data pools, uh, which are managed by the stakeholders defined by the Data Governance Act. What's the difference compared to the GDPR? So the GDPR and traditional data protection principles said that you must minimize, minimize the personal data, you must minimize the personal data processing purpose, uh, do not share the data if it is not necessary. And now we have a new law which says, which is facilitating data sharing, of course, in a compliant manner. But if we talk about compliance, we must build on the existing compliance mechanisms which are established by the GDPR. So GDPR is a first, everything comes after that. And I wanted to briefly talk about these so-called uh, data pools because Jot mentioned that we have entirely new concepts uh, which were not recognized by uh, data protection and other laws uh, before. So data pools are these, uh, is defined by the law as centralized spaces where commercial partners may share, obtain, or uh, maintain uh, personal data. And the establishment of such a pool is, is brings a uh, lot of, lot of uh, possibilities for the industries. And uh, I already mentioned competitiveness on an EU level. And the speakers before me talked about uh, uh, competitiveness in the US, in the China which is built on data. Data pools is one purpose to reach such uh, competitiveness. But again, these data pools must be established in a way that is data protection compliant, not just data protection compliant, but cybersecurity compliant as well. Because if we have a data pool, it's a competitive advantage. It's a trade secret. It must be protected because uh, other stakeholders may have an interest in on that, uh, probably on other continents too. And finally, a, a few words about the AI Act. Uh, the AI Act is, is in progress. I remember that uh, I had a presentation on it on, uh, in the spring, I think around March, and I wanted to recycle that presentation and I saw that I wrote that it will be agreed uh, by this autumn, but it didn't happen because the, the concepts are so deep and so new that it's, it's constantly uh, changed during the negotiation processes, which is not, not a bad thing. So uh, sometimes the negotiation of these new regulations have a, a, a very bad PR because uh, what they communicate that, oh, the EU is struggling with the definition of the artificial intelligence for two years, it doesn't make sense, but no, to have an effect, effective regulation which works in practice, it is necessary to do a deep dive into these concepts. The purpose of the AI Act is to ensure harmonized uh, rules throughout the EU. It prohibits certain AI practices. I'm sure that uh, you are aware of the brief concepts. It establishing specific uh, requirements for certain type of uh, high-risk AI systems 
and uh, it also establishing transparency rules for AI systems. And another question to, to Jod for the uh, roundtable, because uh, he listed certain challenges in connection with AI. And uh, I would love to ask Jod at the end that whether if he's satisfied uh, with the current draft of the AI Act, because the AI Act is trying to provide certain answers to these challenges. And I also listed some challenges which come from data protection perspective uh, in the AI Act, like accountability, security, data minimization, lawful, fair, and transparent data processing. And uh, these are general principles under the GDPR. The GDPR doesn't define them in details either. But if it comes to AI, we must talk about what these principles mean in practice. Like, if you talk about data accuracy, does it mean statistical accuracy in case of the source data of the system? If you talk about risks, do we talk about uh, risk of bias and uh, discrimination? Are these data protection matters? Not exactly, but they can be. As in case of the first three laws that I was talking about, it is necessary to align these terms uh, with the GDPR. And again, uh, individual rights uh, in respect of AI systems. I think the GDPR defined a, a robust framework for data protection rights. Uh, these uh, rights work in practice. Customers, users are aware of these rights. They are not afraid to use them. And uh, I strongly believe that it will be the same in case of AI systems. But if we see the process, how someone is exercising her or his rights, in case of an AI system, we must go deeper, deeper than the GDPR. Like, how do these rights apply in the different stages uh, of the AI's life cycle? How do they relate to the data contained in the AI's model itself? Uh, what if it comes to automated decisions, which is handled by the GDPR already, but uh, the AI mentions it uh, too? And what's the role of human oversight? Again, which is, which is not a new thing. The GDPR introduced it, and the AI Act is building on it. So the two laws must interact in practice. And uh, what I like very much in the AI Act, that uh, it is addressing specific data privacy topics, like uh, how to define biometric data. If the AI Act wants to define the prohibited AI practices, there's a huge debate what is biometric data. That's 100% clear a, a, a data protection thing. And uh, the AI Act is building on the existing definitions of biometric data. And it's very challenging to find a common standard. But at least the AI Act is trying to find an answer for that. It expressly mentions the principle of data minimization, because a recurring criticism of the AI Act is that uh, Data minimization is so old school, it's, uh, it's blocking the development, it's not competitive. And uh, probably to respond to this criticism, the AI Act uh, says that when it comes to training, validation, and testing of data sets, uh, then data minimization has a, a special role and uh, must be interpreted with a view to these new express uh, purposes that are defined by the AI Act. Then, the AI Act uh, provides for a legal basis to process personal data in those so-called so uh, sandboxes, where AI systems are tested. In my practice, I, I constantly receive questions from stakeholders in the market that, oh, we are, we are using this personal data only for testing, it's GD, GDPR doesn't count. And we are always, always telling that no, no, test databases are, 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 are full under the GDPR. And uh, we can also, also show those uh, serious fines from the data protection authorities. Uh, but when it comes to the sandbox in AI development, uh, the AI Act uh, provides an express legal basis to process data in that, and I think it, it gives uh, um, a very good comfort uh, for the stakeholders. Finally, I talked about uh, new data processing purposes, and uh, the AI Act expressly mentions uh, bias monitoring, uh, detection of uh, faults, uh, correcting errors in case of high-risk AI systems, and uh, the AI Act expressly says that uh, the stakeholders can process personal data, even special categories, personal data for that. I think, again, 
uh, that gives a, a very good comfort for those people who are operating AI systems because uh, they are not concerned about uh, the legal basis of the processing of the personal data. Naturally, they must comply with the GDPR, but it's good to see that the AI Act is expressly uh, reflecting to these challenges. And the uh, last, last, last type of data uh, that is, is, is one of my favorites because that's also a recurring question uh, in my practice, that whether companies can keep log data, is this personal data? Can they keep that? If yes, for, for how long? And uh, we just go and check the data protection authorities' uh, practices. But the AI Act is very clear on that, that uh, you can keep log data. Practically, you should keep log data for six months. And that's a very specific, very, very definite thing, uh, which most of the users miss from the GDPR. And uh, I, I, I strong, strongly hope that uh, the draft AI Act will remain this way and we'll be finalized along these uh, principles because making clear rules, rules in connection with data processing gives uh, very much comfort uh, to the people. And I know I was, I was checking Joel's uh, challenge list and I'm, I'm fully aware that the AI doesn't answer all of them, but still, I, I think it's a, a good progress. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Marty, for your uh, interesting uh, presentation. And uh, just three notes briefly uh, about log data. There is a, an ongoing uh, uh, procedure in front of the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, whether you have the right as an individual to learn to see uh, log data. So it's, it's uh, ongoing and we will see the result of this procedure. Uh, as uh, Vice President of the Data Protection Authority here in Hungary, I was uh, wondering when the first criticism during the speeches will come during <laughs> the presentations, but uh, I'm happy that uh, you were, you referred to the uh, slow enforcement or something like this uh, under GDPR. Thank you for this. Um, it's, it's, it's a fair uh, question uh, to raise here. And I also see that you are looking forward to the Q&A uh, that will come, but uh, after uh, the presentations. Uh, and thank you for the questions already uh, in advance. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, his name is uh, Tihomir uh, Katulic. He's from uh, Zagreb, from uh, Croatia. He's a university professor, teaches uh, ICT law at the Faculty of Law, University of Zagreb. Uh, I just had a look at the uh, front page of your presentation and I counted that it's uh, 1669 when your university was uh, established. I guess that the Department of Information Technology, Law and Informatics was established a bit uh, later than that, but uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's just a mathematical uh, question. So, uh, Tihomir is uh, uh, also a data protection uh, consultant and an external expert for the uh, Croatian and also the Macedonian uh, data Protection Authority, as well as an EDPB external pool of experts and uh, ENISA. So this is his background. Tihomir, it is great that you are here and I pass the floor to you. Uh, thank you, Andre. It's a pleasure to be here. I've spent a uh, very nice three days in your beautiful city. And thank you again for inviting me and giving me this ability, uh, opportunity to to join you and your esteemed experts. I really enjoyed the discussions yesterday and today. I'm really uh, 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 wary uh, of the quality of discussions and uh, comments I heard. I learned a lot from many of the presenters yesterday and today. And I'll give just a small uh, contribution, uh, very, very, very short, hopefully. Information uh, security and its regulation is one of those subjects that tend to uh, 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 quickly go into very technical, which is probably not so uh, uh, interesting to most of, of your participants. But still, uh, another thing that's been uh, uh, happening uh, uh, last few weeks in, in, in Brussels is the finalization and the final acceptance in the parliament of the NIS2 proposal, the uh, new uh, uh, development of the uh, Network Information Security Directive, the first uh, EU-wide law on cybersecurity. Uh, one of my first jobs after, after graduating from, from, from the faculty was uh, working for a Croatian national cert. And this topic of information security uh, was always 
of private and, and both uh, uh, theoretical and, and scientific interest to me. And I was always wondering uh, why uh, the, the, the efforts on regulating su a topic su of such importance for the uh, society that increasingly uh, crosses into this information society paradigm, everything is in our computers and our information systems, the data is the new goal. Why are we, are we so slow in uh, embracing uh, uh, what are the standards of, of protection in a, in a, in a general norm. Uh, in the, the last commission, the Juncker Commission, uh, had a, a number of uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, efforts that helped forge the current uh, digital uh, uh, market, common market, and uh, the NIS was, uh, well, in the first real uh, effort of the Union to regulate uh, uh, information security. Uh, building on, of course, different national uh, uh, expertise and, and, and experiences. Um, the, the goal, uh, as it always is, uh, and it, I always like to, to create a parallel with uh, data protection. Uh, when, I, when I first uh, looked at the draft of the uh, future general data protection regulation, I saw how much of it relies on what's are recognized and established practices from information security, from even though the word information security appears only once in, in, the, GD, in the text of the GDPR, uh, concepts like uh, risks uh, appear over 70, over 70 uh, different places, and uh, uh, concepts like uh, impact assessments and the data protection officer and uh, privacy by design by default, all of them stem one way or the other from the practice of information security. Now, the goal of the NIS was to achieve this uh, higher common level of cyber security in member states. Uh, the uh, a choice of a directive uh, stems mainly from the, from the logical uh, situation that uh, information security is often perce perceived as, as an, uh, a portion of a broader topic of, of national security, and which is something not regulated by, uh, by the EU. Um, so it took a while to form this uh, approach of uh, a recognition of certain uh, critical or essential sectors that need to be regulated uh, specially. And um, the uh, use of directive as an instrument always uh, entails the risk of certain fragmentation in how its provisions are uh, understood, interpreted, transposed into national legal systems. Uh, a while back I did a research and I usually uh, always ask Erasmus students who, who, who visit our university uh, through our uh, uh, courses in information security to uh, present the, the, their national uh, uh, frameworks of information security. And uh, it's hard to find a, a, a field that has been so widely and barely uh, uh, regulated as information security in national systems. Some countries uh, use one or two uh, national laws to, to transpose the NIS. Some uh, use over 20. Uh, and uh, keeping track of how everything is, is regulated and uh, what are the standards that are, that are accepted by member states is hard. The uh, ENISA was uh, uh, doing a research on the uh, effects of uh, uh, transposition of the NIS and when I was looking at, at the results I was quite surprised to see that many of the, of the sectors that identified essential service providers by as a requirement by the NIS Many, many, many of the countries uh, recognized only one or two providers, and many of the smaller countries recognized 10 or 15, even though the, the criteria for recognition of essential service providers was supposed to be such to take into account different uh, uh, systems, different sizes of, of member states, and so on. So uh, the transposition efforts were difficult, and a fragmentation occurred, as it usually does with directives. So our solution would be to create a new uh, uh, advanced uh, 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 directive, a new proposal, that's the NIS, as a response to what the uh, research and the activities of both member states and ANISA show that the threats are 
uh, uh, indeed rising and uh, uh, that the current uh, framework is not an efficient uh, way to, of, of dealing with them. An additional goal was this perceived problem that most of, if not all, uh, uh, data protection authorities have in investigating uh, 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 breaches that uh, require uh, additional technical expertise, uh, digital forensics, uh, most, if not all, only perhaps the largest advisor, uh, supervisory bodies have the internal capacity to conduct such investigations and to uh, uh, efficiently uh, uh, supervise uh, organizations uh, in, in the field of data protection. So perhaps something could be done about that in, 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 in a more indirect way. And this is uh, one of the ideas that the proposal puts forward that, that is interesting from the data protection perspective. Now, uh, if you are interested in information security and the uh, uh, activities of ANISA, then you know of the annual ANISA uh, uh, report, on uh, a threat report, uh, which traditionally, for, even though ANISA was established as a continuous agency by the, NIA, uh, by the actual Cybersecurity Act in 2018, for the, even 10 years before that, this uh, report was uh, a, a really good starting point in investigating the occurrence of uh, cybersecurity threats uh, uh, in, in the EU. Um, so the report recognizes uh, uh, prime uh, threats to information security, uh, traditional categories of malware and especially ransomware, which are always on the seem always to be on the rise in social engineering. In later years, threats against data, threats against availability, uh, especially uh, denial of service attacks and threats against internet infrastructure. Uh, of course, uh, disinformation, misinformation campaigns, which we've discussed yesterday, uh, and the attacks on the, on the supply chains for information uh, services. Uh, the report also recognizes uh, the trend, uh, trends in, in development of these threats uh, from year to year. Looking back at the last several reports, uh, ransomware and malware are still uh, rank uh, among the highest. Uh, of course, the current uh, political situation is also uh, a strong motivator for uh, 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 various groups that uh, participate in committing uh, 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 cyber attacks. What's also interested is that the uh, uh, hacker as a service model is, is still uh, expanding. Uh, even with all the regulation in, in place and all the efforts, this uh, model of committing cybercrime is, is uh, augmented by, by developments such as cryptocurrencies and all other uh, uh, abilities that, that, that help the flourishing of this underground market for uh, committing cybercrime. Phishing is still a dominant attack vector, and now we have also uh, AI or uh, machine learning coming into play, both as a, uh, these systems are being targeted and compromised, as well as they're being increasingly used to enable uh, dissemination, uh, the, the deep fakes, the, the uh, uh, videos that are basically uh, hard to discern from the real thing, uh, another uh, okay, so uh, another thing uh, interesting in, in the report is uh, the percentage of, of uh, uh, each sector that's been targeted by serious uh, information security breaches. It's no wonder that uh, sectors like finance and public administration lead uh, uh, with the percentage of, of attacks uh, uh, aimed at them. But what's really interesting is that service providers, digital service providers, and uh, media and entertainment are also now uh, slowly rising, rising uh, on, on the scale of, of uh, uh, number of attacks committed against them. Okay, so, uh, as I said, the uh, initial scope of the NIS was limited in, because of mainly political reasons, trying to focus uh, the efforts in, in a small number of uh, sectors that were considered uh, essential or critical. Um, the criteria for recognizing organizations that were subjected to the NIS requirements was not sufficiently clear. Uh, the states 
being a directive, had wide discretion uh, how to uh, regulate security and uh, incident reporting requirements into their national legal systems. And uh, from uh, both national and European uh, uh, level, the uh, enforcement regime is ineffective, and there are various differences between member states uh, uh, in, in fulfilling these obligations. So these are all problems with the, uh, with the transposition uh, uh, of the NIS, and the new proposal was uh, uh, developed to try to address these uh, situations. So, um, uh, this, these are the uh, new, uh, uh, one of the terms is new, it's not digital operator, it's not important service operator as a recognized category of uh, organizations recognized by the uh, uh, NIS too. Uh, they need to take appropriate and uh, proportionate technical organizational measures, and the proposal lists these measures, and anyone who's ever, ever had contact with uh, information security standards and practice recognizes these measures as something that is basically uh, a part of those standards, like risk analysis and security policies, uh, 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 incident handling, uh, business continuity and crisis management, uh, the regulation of uh, and uh, controlling of uh, supply chains, uh, and of course developing policies and procedures to uh, secure, uh, uh, to, 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 to address the risks, to um, uh, control the acquisition uh, of new information security services, and of course the, the use of uh, cryptogra cryptography and encryption. So uh, what the uh, member states will have to do is to ensure that their competent authorities effectively monitor uh, uh, and ensure compliance with, with the NIS standards, especially regarding the mentioned technical and organizational measures. And the uh, interesting part here is that these authorities, whoever they are, in, what, in, in which country, the, the institutional framework of information security is different. For example, in Croatia, there are three different uh, uh, organizations, uh, institutions, uh, governmental institutions that participate in the system of information security, from the national cert uh, to uh, 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 security uh, of information systems bureau to the uh, council of national security. So I imagine that in every member state, there's going to be not just one, but probably more uh, uh, institutions participating in this, and they will, in case of breaches which may uh, contain uh, 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 personal data, will cooperate with data protection authorities. Um, the competent authorities uh, will uh, have the power to, to uh, subject, uh, um, recognize essential and uh, important entities to different measures such as inspections and regular audits. Uh, the difference between essential entities and the other, on the next slide, important entities, is that the essential entities are basically uh, have an additional additional obligation they, they need to uh, fulfill. So uh, the transposition laws will now mandate uh, or would mandate uh, that uh, these organizations need to uh, uh, conduct regular uh, security audits carried out by qualified auditors. Uh, and keep uh, evidence of these audits. So these are, they are in some sectors, in finance, in telecom industry, these are not new obligations, but they are new to many of, of organizations who are now going to be under the uh, uh, NIS2 scope. Um, those important entities, especially digital service providers like marketplaces, search engines, and, 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 uh, and other, uh, will, of course, also have to uh, submit to, to similar uh, 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 obligations. And the probably most important thing uh, is this uh, provision regarding fines, just like the focus when GDPR was coming into, into force was on the, 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 the system of uh, 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 fines. 
uh, administrative fines uh, with those two categories of up to 2% or 10 million euros and 4% or 20 million euros. The NIS2 proposal uh, now uh, provides that, uh, that the uh, member states should ensure uh, uh, fines up to 10 million euros or 2% of the worldwide annual turnover for obligations of uh, uh, in implementing the technical organizational measures I mentioned before and uh, in, in the Article 18 of the proposal and the obligations regarding the discovery and reporting and handling of information security incidents in Article 20 uh, of the proposal. Uh, so, uh, the, the proposal also details a bit more about uh, infringements uh, that deal with personal uh, data breach. Uh, there is a provision that uh, when the competent authorities have indications that infringement uh, is by an essential or import, uh, important entity, uh, they shall inform the competent supervisory authorities. Should uh, the author competent authorities be from one state, uh, supervisory authorities in data protection in one state, and in, in NIS, a competent authority in another state, then uh, they should first uh, uh, inform their national uh, data protection authority. This is also a provision that will uh, hopefully help foster better cooperation uh, between data protection authorities and information security authorities uh, uh, as, as a result. So, try to be uh, very brief about this. Uh, of course, this is, has been at this point accepted uh, by the, uh, voted by the Parliament, it leaves uh, the Council, but uh, out of all uh, information regarding this proposal, this will uh, probably come into effect very soon with a pretty short uh, 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 period for, uh, for transposition. And hopefully this will help uh, create a more uh, responsible and more effective system of information security under the common market. Uh, of course, it means a lot of uh, additional obligations for many organizations. Uh, the, the documents accompanying the proposals uh, mentioned uh, a really large number of organizations that, that now, uh, as the Commission perceives, will come under these obligations. So this is definitely going to cost, but hopefully it will create a better framework to respond to a threat which is ultimately only, only, only rising. Okay, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, uh, Tihomir, for your presentation and special thanks for bringing uh, network and information security aspects into the discussion. Uh, before I uh, give the floor to our next speaker, I just would like to uh, share an anecdote with you. This morning, when we first uh, saw each other, uh, I, I proudly shared with him that, uh, look, I practice your name, so can I can uh, moderate this panel smoothly. And uh, he said, come on, just call me Vagelis. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I, I would like to give you the floor, but first I would like to uh, give a, a short presentation. So um, Vagelis is a professor at the uh, VUB uh, University in Brussels. Uh, his research focuses on personal data protection, both from an EU and international perspective with an emphasis on supervision in particular data protection authorities, global cooperation. So we look forward to your presentation and please uh, also uh, include, uh, since you are from Brussels, the Brussels effect. The floor is yours. I will, I promise. But that was a spoiler. That was my, my last slide, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. I apologize for my last name. It's impossible. And uh, even, even the first one gives me trouble, but imagine it. But I'm so, <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to be here and uh, be able to bring forward uh, five uh, highly personal, hopefully simple points that uh, to me are relevant as regards uh, data protection and uh, platforms. And uh, you may not uh, agree with them, but hopefully they will uh, ignite some discussion in the Q&A session that uh, is to follow. So to briefly summarize, first point, but that is the easy one, that the GDPR is everywhere. Second point, uh, however, states are nowhere to be found. 
at least uh, when it comes to platform regulation. Uh, nevertheless, platforms themselves are not state agnostic altogether. And finally, about the Brussels effect. Yes, the Brussels effect is very much uh, true and uh, alive and uh, kicking, uh, but it is also a workaround. Uh, it is also hiding the role of states today and uh, a workaround uh, for them need to be found, needs to be found in the very near future. So taking it uh, one step at a time, first, uh, but of course that point has been made by the first two speakers, uh, the GDPR is everywhere. Uh, it can't be a panacea, it can't be a pill, uh, the go-to law to, to, to address everything and anything under the sun when it comes to the regulation of technology, but also when it comes to regulation of our everyday lives. So the fact that we are here is regulated by the GDPR, the cameras, the microphones, the attendance forms that we all signed, our consent to be here. But um, even when uh, each one of us wakes up in the morning, uh, our day, our everyday life is regulated constantly by the GDPR. We wake up, we put on our wearables or we keep our digital uh, wake up times and everything is GDPR. We go to the streets to travel to work, it's GDPR with a camera, uh, the cameras and everything, the, the processing. At the employment, of course, it is GDPR applicable. And even in the evening when the, we practice some fitness or go out again, most of the times it's GDPR. The very same law, and the very same authority that uh, apply, monitors and uh, applies this law and helps us with it uh, is also applicable with platforms. And perhaps the idea is that we are asking too much from the same law, regulate at the same time Facebook itself and my everyday life, and too much to ask from the authorities that uh, help us uh, implement it in practice. Therefore, the GDPR is everywhere. But at the same time, states are nowhere to be found when it comes to, to platform regulation. And that point needs a bit of explanation. So the, the, first, uh, uh, the first image there is uh, probably a well-known one from Leviathan. So the general idea is that, uh, according to Hobbes, but I'm a fan, so, but you, you may disagree openly. Uh, we live together in states because the state, the monarch back then, could provide security, so the state can provide security to us all. Otherwise, our lives out there would be short, brutish, and one more thing, but terrible anyway. So the, the basic, essential function of a state is to provide security to its citizens. And therefore, there was this uh, picture that was done back then by the king, who stood above and had a helicopter view of, uh, its, of the subjects below. So there was a hierarchy. At the top of it was the monarch. Today is the government, the democratically elected government. And it, its role is to provide security. And that was done because it stood above all else. There was a hierarchy. And all transactions, all everyday lives of humans took place locally. There was no nothing coming into the state that was not controlled by the monarch, by the government. And uh, this was true even, uh, even during the 90s. Even during the 90s, uh, some of us remember when we were buying software, we were buying software off the shelves, as CDs or uh, floppy disks and everything, and we were installing to computers, we were not downloading it. Therefore, again, the state could control all transactions and all lives of its citizens and protect them because all our lives took place locally. But this has changed, and this comes the, the second picture, because platforms are directed to us on a super local level. They transcend national borders and they bypass essentially the government. So they bypass, they circumvent, and they destroy, in a way, Leviathan, uh, because by now the state does not control my relationship with Facebook or with another platform. This is a parallel universe to which the state has very little uh, knowledge or way to intervene. And this has reversed a model by which humanity has uh, survived since it first appeared and we lived in organized societies. Nevertheless, it would be false to assume that platforms are uh, supernatural uh, organizations uh, with uh, supernatural powers that are state agnostic. No, they live on this planet. They are uh, 
uh, compliant to certain laws, but not to everybody's laws. They are compliant and they adhere to, and they must follow the rules and politics of the countries where they reside in. And this has been provided to us uh, time and again, both as regards Facebook and other platforms residing in the USA, and other platforms, Alibaba, for example, and TikTok uh, of these days, residing in China. So platforms themselves are not above states. It is just they are above certain states. But anyway, uh, a minor point so in, in passing that I wanted to make is that uh, there may be a risk after two days of talking about platforms that uh, we come up uh, with the result, that with the conclusion that platforms themselves are a bad thing. They are not. So I'm a huge fan of uh, platforms because uh, actually what they do is that they empower individuals, both personally, financially, if you wish, and uh, democratically, uh, because uh, they open up new markets. E even the gig economy is an economy needs to be regulated, of course, but still is an economy, something new. A lot of people have found, have found professional lives on the platforms that were not, uh, did not exist in the past. And of course, democratically, we all know that there are new forms of organization of groups of people that have been uh, made possible by platforms. Therefore, please, and as a parenthesis, do not uh, leave this two-day conference uh, thinking that platforms is a bad thing that we would be better off without them. At least, I do not agree with this, uh, with this idea. Anyway, so, Going back to the Leviathan, so to say, problem, what can a state, a modern state, do if it wishes to protect its citizens, protect their privacy, this is a privacy panel, so protect their privacy and at the same time deal with platforms? Again, experience has shown us that a modern state, if it is not the, the US, uh, America and uh, China, cannot really fight with platforms. Some states have tried and have, uh, if not outright lost, then come to an understanding with a platform. But again, imagine a state coming to understanding with a platform and be happy about it and celebrating about it. Politicians feel very happy that somehow they managed to get a deal out of a platform, out of Facebook and Google uh, specifically. Um, states, most states cannot also use the traditional uh, method that also Zolt uh, referred to, using fines. Do something about platforms that they think infringe the rights of their citizens whom they want to protect. But they cannot impose fines, really, on platforms. And uh, I have also only noted clear review here because it's become a tradition in, uh, among uh, DPAs in Europe to impose 20 million fines. So it is the Italian, the French, the Greek one, but, but still, they are imposing a clear view, of course, is not is an AI, it's not a platform, but it is typical of the lack of power, and here Andre may, may disagree, but of the lack of power of national DPAs to do something about a phenomenon that is annoying and infringing of uh, their citizens' rights, but does not really reside within their jurisdiction. So they just impose fines that they know cannot be um, actually uh, put to practice. And uh, finally, uh, I think that point was made also yesterday, that uh, states, uh, objectively, most states cannot write laws on platforms because they lack the experience, the resources, the capacity, and even the willingness at the end of the day to regulate something. So very few states, very big states, have gone on and written something about platform, but still not a comprehensive regulation on platforms. Therefore, again, the, the, this is a dead end. Now, what is being done, and what we are lucky to have uh, us uh, living in Europe, is that uh, the EU has can come to the rescue of uh, member states. So, in a way, in a way, we are entering a fight with platforms, nation states, so member states are entering a fight uh, with platforms that they cannot win. So they bring their bigger brother, so to say, so more power to the to the game. And yes, in that way, the EU can win. We have seen it again, time and again, that the EU can actually impose regulations on platforms, and platforms respect the EU. The GDPR is uh, a prime example in this case. To me, it's an absolute success and uh, has shown the way. And now we have uh, many new acts 
that are coming up, the DMA, the DSA, more than 10 uh, lately, regulating platforms and uh, the digital economy. So yes, the EU can do it because of its volume. Because it is composed of all of us, therefore it is, uh, it is in a position to, to negotiate and impose uh, uh, rules to platforms. Therefore, the Brussels effect, the Brussels effect effectively is that whatever Brussels do, the EU does, then affects the planet, so to, to be accurate. Um, and it is, uh, it, it is true and it's very uh, much uh, alive. Uh, the GDPR again has set the example and it's been replicated essentially in countries such as China with all the restrictions there, uh, India, Brazil. Uh, it is also affecting the Americans in perhaps more ways than they would care to admit uh, publicly, but still so. It has become a global example and it is uh, the way uh, forward. Uh, therefore, the Brussels effect shows that it is doable and it can also be a beacon, a light for the rest of, uh, of humanity and the planet. However, at the same point, the, the EU coming to the rescue, us bringing our bigger and larger brother to the fight and uh, the EU providing the solution, also in a way hides the problem. Hides the problem of the states having lost their role, specifically when it comes to protecting their citizens from platforms that exceed today, in today's world, their capacities. So I will leave it like that and uh, invite you all to think what could be the role of states in the future in this regard, protecting their citizens on the internet in general, and uh, something yeah, to be discussed in the future. So thank you very much. And, yeah. Thank you very much, Vagalis, for your presentation, and also including Brussels effect. Uh, now we know. Okay, great. Uh, and this is exactly what I wanted to ask, uh, to have the app on the screen, uh, just for the audience to know. If they would like to ask questions, they can do so uh, via slido.com, and you will see the event code uh, on the screen. Great, so we arrive now at the Q&A, and, &A, and uh, actually we have quite a lot of questions that were already raised uh, by the participants themselves. So I, I, I know that uh, Martin uh, has raised a couple of questions and uh, also uh, there are remainders. So maybe uh, if it is okay for you, everyone has a micro, I think. So uh, Martin, if you would like to provoke the discussion on uh, what you have raised, just uh, please go ahead. Is that on? Is it on? <clears throat> So that, that was a very, very simple question on the, on the AI Act, uh, and it was addressed to Joel, but I would, I would be happy to see your opinion on the AI Act as well. Because I, AI Act has this uh, buzz that it will be the next GDPR, and, and GDPR has a, has a bad PR. So, and from this perspective, we don't, we don't want to have a new, new GDPR. We want to have a, an AI Act that is... Uh, uh, competitive, uh, understandable, transparent, etc. So, and, and I'm interested in your opinion on the AI Act. Joet, especially, you listed those challenges. Does the AI Act answer those, or what, how do you see that? Uh, um, as I, I haven't um, studied uh, deeply the new text by the pre Czech presidency, as I, I heard, they restricted, for example, the list of uh, risk, uh, high risk. Um, AIs, uh, that, that was, I think, the, one of the greatest problems, that, that, that it was too long. Um, uh, I have other kind of problems with the AI. I don't think that it, is, it answers all the questions, but it, it answers some of, some of these challenges, uh, because it is, it is based on this new approach, uh, that, that the data is more a resource than, than uh, something that should be protected, or, uh, or not, and not just uh, uh, sees the... The, the problem from that angle, uh, but it has other, other kind of problems that it wants to apply the product conformity uh, rules uh, to a field where not the uh, uh, 
were, were human rights at stake? And how could you, I mean, this, these two things for me is like, it, it's not reconcilable. I, I think that the product uh, compliance uh, rules are not uh, good for protecting human rights. That's, that's my problem with the AI Act. But uh, I hope I answered to your question. Some of, some of the problems are uh, yeah, tackled uh, uh, in the AI Act or it will be, I think that, that, that won't have such a bad PR as the, as the GDPR. I don't think so. Uh, I'm very sorry to hear about this bad PR of the GDPR. Uh, but anyway, we do our best uh, as uh, regulators to enforce it uh, in, a, in the daily life. Okay, uh, anyone else on this question on MI, um, AI? AI? Okay, okay, so let's, uh, let's go further. Um, uh, actually, I don't see uh, questions from the audience. You have the preference, so uh, if you have questions, please ask. Otherwise, we go ahead uh, along the logic. Uh, it uh, is... There is one question. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, uh, yeah, I think, uh, of course... I can borrow my mic too. Thank you very much. My name is Andrei Kolk from Slovakia. I'm following the Vangelis uh, presentation, which was very nice and uh, persuasive, but at the same time, I feel there's a lot of skepticism about the national state's powers, or governments, basically, because we don't talk about states. That's imaginary something, you know, but governments, uh, parliaments, and other bodies, etc. And I think there are examples, you know, like small government, small states, okay, <laughs> like Lithuania or Latvia, one of these, and others managed to make deals even with Facebook and other companies on their own, even a couple of years ago, because I did kind of research on that. So I don't think that small countries or government, or even bigger ones like UK or Germany, for example, they are not, they are, I don't think they are so important, so to say. There are examples, even Australia is actually doing pretty well in many cases, you know, from regulation, sanctions, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So, and of course I support this coordination at the EU level, et cetera, that makes sense, of course, for very small states in particular. But I don't think that, in other words, that evidence doesn't support this skepticism. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. This is. This is exactly what it is. It is skepticism, and uh, of course, it is empirical. Uh, but the, on the only thing that I would like to point out is, uh, use your words. You, you discussed uh, about deals. So states making deals with platforms. This is bad to me. States make laws. They do not make deals, especially with private uh, actors. So this, this is a reversal of what they traditionally did. They, made, uh, they make laws. They enter international uh, conventions or uh, international agreements, international law. <laughs> Until recently, there is nowhere I make a deal with a private uh, actor. But now it is on the agenda, and they are very happy to achieve it. So uh, this is, uh, of course, I do not see the role of governments going away. No way. This is not what I mean. But I'm skeptical how it can continue to exist. And I think that we need to you know, have a new perspective. Okay, thank you for the question and for the answer. Yes, please, tell me. go ahead. Yeah, just to, just to, maybe with the, sure, okay. sure. Uh, I was just wanted to clarify, maybe I, I, I missed something, but uh, you were discussing about the uh, proportionate inability of smaller states to, to, to react to the platforms. Uh, uh, there was a recent case uh, uh, of, of Meta uh, in front of the Irish uh, DPA, which intended to find them around 50 or 60 million, I think, but several other member states uh, uh, raised this to the EDPB and the final fine was in ballpark of 400 million, I think. So you, is, is that an argument against this, this position or is it proving that coordination actually works? No, the, the GDPR, I would have mentioned it, but I'm not going to make it very long, the presentation. The GDPR is a fine example of how this uh, would work because a lot of uh, DPAs, and again, and there are, this is, <laughs> a lot of DPAs tried to go ahead, to move ahead alone and uh, do something about Facebook or Instagram, but uh, they were in one way or another stopped and the one-stop-shop mechanism was enacted. And, and I think it is working. So 
I think this is exactly the, the way forward. And now that you opened the... Uh, also, I think that the, D, the DMA that was discussed in the previous uh, panel could also be the way forward because we see a very important uh, change, shift in paradigm in the DMA. We see uh, subject matter taken away from national authorities and uh, be dealt with by the Commission directly. This could also, while not, of course, uh, doing away with national uh, competition authorities. So this could be the way forward for data protection too. But I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. If, if, if I can just uh, shortly reflect. So uh, I, I remember back in uh, 2018 that uh, all my colleagues said that, uh, okay, our, our, our job is done because GDPR is here. It's a European thing. Everything will be uniform. There will be no data, national data protection laws. It will be one-stop shop. <laughs> there will be nothing to do for national data protection authorities. And uh, it didn't happen. So I, the other way around, uh, that's right. The, the other, other thing, it's very thought-provoking thought that, that you said that we, we don't make deals with uh, platforms, with passing laws. I don't think that making deals is is bad from scratch. So, well, someone let these platforms grow big and they just cannot be regulated by passing laws. It, it requires a conversation. Consider that bad or good, but that, that's reality. Jot, jo, you wanted want to say something about no, no, the no, It can be, it can be, but it's new. This is why I said that it's new. So I do not want to put forward solutions or this is, it is new making deals with. It, it, it's a each challenge. one having yeah. its, its own deal. So I don't know, Belgium have a different deal than Hungary, a different deal than Italy and then a different, it's new. Um, I. I think I have to say something because uh, the uh, authorities were addressed and also the uh, cooperation among the supervisory authorities. And also there is a question um, uh, saying that uh, there is cooperation between uh, DPAs finding uh, Google Analytics for transferring personal data to the US. Do you think that such coordinated action can reach effect? So my answer to the question that it should uh, reach effect, what else? should reach, reach effect, if not a, a harmonized uh, enforcement action. Uh, but uh, going back to this uh, question, uh, yesterday we had a slide in the screen, uh, you know, describing the situation of the poor citizen who was complaining about uh, Facebook. So this, this poor Hungarian uh, person who, who lodged a complaint in Hungary, and then the complaint was transmitted to Ireland, and then you know, uh, there was basically no perspective to have a quick and efficient uh, decision on the problem uh, the, the uh, uh, complainant was raising uh, at the beginning. The permanent question is that uh, on the internet, everything is happening here and now, and your uh, situation is based on the data available here and now. And then we have a complaint mechanism that takes really much time, and it, it, it does not seem effective. That's, uh, that's a matter of fact, uh, but it should be. So my question would be, um, if the GDPR has a bad reputation, what would be the ideal? Maybe uh, you can uh, talk about that now, absolutely without any responsibility, uh, what would be uh, an ideal model uh, of uh, regulating and enforcing. Uh, but uh, just a couple of questions uh, regarding uh, GDPR enforcement, because uh, I'm uh, permanently representing Hungary within the EDPB, and I, I have an insight uh, you may not have. So we have learned a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we have this learning curve. You, you know this, uh, that uh, you, you, uh, you can draw a line where you will be in two, three, or whatever uh, years. And uh, almost five years after the GDPR, uh, we can, I can tell you that we cannot jump this learning curve. So even if y you would like us to jump, I don't know, five years within one year, we cannot do that. Why is that? Because it's 
pretty complicated. Imagine that there are 31 delegations around the table. So it's, it's a big uh, working group. Uh, for example, there is uh, this Article 66 on the urgency procedure with a two weeks deadline. Come on, it's impossible. You, you simply literally cannot do that within two weeks with uh, 31 participants. It's simply not feasible. But regarding the ordinary procedures, let's put it in this way, ordinary procedures, what we have learned, you know, at, at the very beginning, we were absolutely excited uh, submitting a relevant and reasoned objection. We were, you know, almost uh, with uh, shaking hands, we were writing uh, that it should be like this and that. Uh, and then uh, we learned it, how to do it, even if, you know, uh, the first one uh, was due to formal reasons, declined and so on. So we had to learn that. So the colleagues sitting at the table had to learn that. It takes time. Uh, what we also learned is that uh, there is not an urgent need to, to, to submit a, a, an objection. You know, if you read article uh, 60 and 65, you will see that if as a concerned supervisory authority, you are not in agreement with the draft decision tabled by the lead, lead supervisory authority, then you may uh, submit a relevant and reasoned objection. This is a sort of veto. You have the right to do so if you are a concerned supervisory authority. You can be a concerned supervisory authority by having data subjects or having an establishment or having a complainant in your country. So uh, the next stage of this learning curve is that let's wait. Maybe others will submit a relevant and reasoned objection and you don't have to do so on your own. So this is a lesson what we didn't know at the beginning. We had to learn that, we had to experience that so that we can uh, be there. And then, of course, uh, you may declare that it's a nice uh, objection and we will agree. And this is a signal to the lead supervisory authority that be careful, you won't have the majority for your position within the board. Uh, and another lesson is that even if we, we receive some criticism from outside that, uh, you know, uh, authorities do not agree in different matters, they have different approaches and so on. Uh, there is a hard lesson within the EDPB and this is majority voting. So if you have 15 votes, because there are a couple of uh, authorities, they do not vote, then you have the majority. So if you don't have that behind yourself as a lead supervisor or authority, you will fail. So you will be in a position to write a decision you are not in agreement with. Of course, you can discuss you know, this uh, uh, independence issue, whether you are still independent. If you have to write and sign a decision you are disagreeing with. Of course, this is the price for a harmonious application, by the way. So these are the lessons we have learned uh, in the recent years. And uh, that was not visible back in 2016 or 18, uh, when we learned how GDPR should be implemented. So this is just this is something complementary to what uh, we are discussing here. So GDPR is up and running, but it has its, uh, how to say, uh, its way, its path uh, to do it. But if you have a better idea, then I would be really uh, curious to learn that, because I think, I think this is a permanent question to us. Uh, how to do it better? Of course, uh, you may have better resources for the supervisory authorities. Imagine, supervisory authorities, the majority of them publicly admits that they don't have sufficient resources to carry out their tasks under GDPR. Majority of them, I don't remember the percentage, maybe 77, I don't know. Imagine the situation. So uh, this, is, this is a significant uh, problem to mention here. But uh, really, uh, we are talking uh, and, uh, through issues, discussing uh, matters without any major responsibility. So uh, I think if uh, GDPR has a bad reputation or it is you know, not uh, the, the best possible uh, means uh, for enforcement, I'm really uh, curious and would like to open the floor for uh, better ideas. I'm really eager uh, to learn. Uh, I, I just one remark for because you started your speech with uh, with this poor guy who is who's, who has a complaint, and 
uh, it will be very interesting to see what will happen under the DSA because DSA is creating two uh, complaint mechanisms on the on the on the platforms. One is the internal complaint mechanisms, which should be enacted by the by the platforms internally, and there is an outside out of the court uh, mechanism where where uh, these bodies should be accredited, but there will be bodies. I'm very curious about that. How many data protection issues will be raised before these these fora, and uh, what will then be the role of the of the of the authority the protection authorities within these within these issues will they be, they be involved into these disputes or or what, what, what will happen because I'm quite sure that uh, that uh, some complaints will be about data protection issues or, or some complaints has will have a data protection aspect as well so that that will, that will be a very interesting uh, that this is I think a very interesting question Can I reflect? So, uh, uh, when I talked about the authorities, just don't 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 take it personal. <laughs> no, no I, I absolutely I, not. And uh, it's in my job description to, to receive such uh, so, criticism. Uh, because the mechanism that you described, it sounds good and, and, and well established. Uh, sometimes I see it from the outside, from a, a, a stakeholders, like a company's perspective, and. Uh, for example, they say, or they ask me, can, can we use Google Analytics? And I say, no, you cannot. Then I talk about uh, Schrems, then I talk about Privacy Shield. Maybe that I mentioned that the Austrian authority prohibited it. Then my client will ask me, okay, did they impose a fine? Uh, no, they just prohibited it. And well, it's in Austria, not in Hungary. Then my client will say, it doesn't care. And we'll continue using it. And he will think that, okay, there's the GDPR thing but doesn't make too much sense. Uh, so th this is why I said that the GDPR has a bad PR because that's what they say. Or, or another example when um, it was full, full of the headlines that uh, uh, Meta is prohibited in Europe. Meta will move out from Europe. And then I asked my colleague, let's just look into deeper how this process works. Just, just what you described that how the lead authority's decision can be contested. And it's a long process and, and it, 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 makes, it makes sense. But what the data subjects see, that there was this buzz that Meta is forbidden, uh, then, then nothing happens because authorities are discussing each other. From a lawyer's perspective, I, I completely understand that. It's just the, the appearance. Okay. Fine, we received the next question. Uh, I will read it out, and uh, if you understand it, then please answer. When, if ever, we achieve the age of Lex Informatica, Reidenberg, 1998. Is it, is it there? Do you have an idea on this question? What was the question with the Lex Informatica? Uh, when, if ever, we achieve the age of Lex Informatica, and there is a referral to Reidenberg, 1998, I think. Yeah, 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 this is... Um, was the, there is the, the, uh, well, we are now in the age of Lex Informatica, I think, so, so that's, the, that's, the, that's the answer, if I understand it well, when we reach this. I mean, in certain respects, because that's about that, uh, uh, that uh, that, uh, that the, the, the codes uh, are behavioral uh, control tools as well. So that's, that's the whole concept is about that. But it was uh, Lawrence Lessig was, uh, has been written about this thing. And then after that, uh, uh, Roger Brown's word, it's widely accepted that in the cyberspace, uh, the main behavioral control are codes. We are in that period and we are that in that age that in certain respects our behavior is controlled uh, have in a very often, I would say that, or at least in the cyberspace by uh, by code. So we are living in that. That's the answer. We are in that period. We are in that age. We are living in that age. I I, I, I concur. So it's under the Czech presidency, we we calculated and and I don't know. 30 legislative proposals which are in progress and just just check my email my colleague it sent in the morning that uh, yesterday dora was accepted uh, fintech amending directive was accepted uh, nis2 was accepted and there's a statement about esports and uh, video games and it's just uh, only this week in the eu so it's it's, it's fun to be an it lawyer these days <laughs> so fresh news from brussels <laughs> 
Okay. Um, then let's go further. We, we keep receiving the questions, and thank you for the active participation of the audience. Uh, now we go back to the platform regulation, how to find the best uh, possible model of uh, regulation. Uh, the question reads, can a consensus-based multi-stakeholder approach to platform governance be a way forward? For example, set up councils with representatives of state platforms and users. How do you see? Is it uh, is it a possible way to to govern to govern uh, platforms? There, there's a kind of attempt. It's not entirely the same, but uh, but uh, Facebook's uh, uh, how do you call the, the Supreme Court <laughs> is this is, is that kind of an initiative because they collected uh, from all. Uh, ways of life uh, 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 people there and uh, and I don't think that it solves the the structural problems and it solves the the majority of the of the complaints and and uh, in every it's it's just a demonstrative something which which solves uh, uh, landmark cases or whatever and these kind of uh, I think committees or whatever could uh, have uh, a positive effect on the policy making or whatever, but uh, but the everyday problems uh, they cannot solve the everyday problems of the of the of the or the problems that has been that are raised uh, daily uh, by the platforms. I don't think so. I'm not. I'm very skeptical about these uh, about about these committees and they're, they're and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Please go ahead. Um, it could. On the side. That's a, that's yeah. a thing. Um, consensus is very much in trend uh, these days, and uh, it could work, consensus reaching committees and everything. In principle, I'm opposed to consensus-seeking uh, procedures because I think that there lack transparency. Uh, in principle, and this applies also to finding a solution out of... Uh, um, a platform-related problem, or even in politics. Because when I hear consensus, I immediately imagine committees uh, convened behind closed doors and bargaining. So I give you this, you give me that, and then next time I do something different. And uh, this is not transparent, does not come out to the public. The public is then faced with a solution, such and such, without critical background knowledge, or without even a complete picture. So I do not think consensus is. I do not personally like consensus. And I do not, uh, and most certainly, I do not think consensus is a solution for regulation, or far from a replacement for regulation. We've also seen what happened with self-regulation in the past. It's long gone, forgotten uh, idea. Um, so consensus is the next step in that process, and I'm, uh, in principle, opposed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question and the answers. Uh, uh, Marcy, you mentioned that the uh, Network and Information Security uh, Directive 2 has been uh, approved this morning, Is right? It, uh, Parliament approved it, uh, I think okay. it said yesterday. Okay. All so right. the, uh, the Council must have its, its final say. Okay, all right. And no, it's just a question to Tihomir if you uh, allow, uh, if this. Uh, uh, legislative act is going to be approved. Uh, what impact it's going to have on platforms and what uh, users will benefit from it? Well, technically it should uh, help users achieve uh, a better level of confidence into all kinds of services that are based on information systems that may be targeted. So many of the largest platforms uh, for different reasons already implement information security standards without uh, a norm forcing them to do that. But now having uh, uh, an obligatory mandatory framework that uh, will, will mandate that will hopefully raise this level of, 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 um, of believing into security in the systems from the perspective of users to a higher level. Okay, okay, all right. Because it's really very close, and I just wanted to see uh, what impact it's going to have on us and platforms. Okay, any further questions? Okay, uh, in the first row. Uh, please go ahead, we will make sure that you get a micro. I would like to ask a micro for uh, the lady here in the first row. Okay, thank you, Joe. 
Hi. Um, I don't know if this question is relevant, but um, just uh, in view of you know all the platforms and what's happening around the world, how are you considering um, I, um, diversity of information and freedom of speech when regulating platforms um, in regulation to the EU, um, European re regulations? And how can you um, safeguard kind of financial interests when it comes to the US and China, for example? Um, how can you ensure that ethics are balanced against kind of financial gains or um, uh, or um, competitiveness of the European market? Thank you. That's quite a complex uh, question. Uh, I think uh, it included a lot of. Restart the counter. Restart the counter. Yes. To ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, but you, you raised a lot of questions. So I would like to open the floor for anyone who would like to comment on it. Or, yeah, I... Uh, this is the essence of the question, how best to do this. So I think that it depends on the, the way you enter the, the, the question, your, your perspective before entering this question. So if your perspective before uh, replying is uh, pro-human rights, then you provide with law that is such and such. If your perspective is pro-profit uh, uh, retaining and profit protecting uh, uh, perspective, then the outcome of the lawmaking process will be uh, drafted in, uh, in the relevant manner. Generally, in Europe, this time of uh, year and this uh, period of uh, history were pro-human rights, both at the member state level and uh, within the court. Uh, of the EU, therefore the solutions that are mostly given to technological, to technology related problems are pro-human rights, uh, protecting the individual to the detriment of, uh, of, um, of monetary value of the same transaction, so to the detriment of the protection of financial interests. But this is a balance that can change in the future, or uh, this can be uniquely European uh, perspective, or even only in my head, <laughs> I don't know. And there is another balancing uh, exercise, which is like the security versus the, the, the freedom of speech. I mean, because the more freedom of speech you give to the, to the ordinary users on the, on the platforms, the, the less security they will have. So that's, that's again, a balancing activity. And, and moreover, which is even worse, there is a political split here because the, the say, the right uh, side of the spectrum says is a, is a pro uh, freedom of speech. Uh, um, uh, they have this attitude. Uh, the, the, the left uh, side says uh, is more for security, uh, and therefore you cannot solve this problem uh, once for all. I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, you have to have the, this balancing uh, balancing uh, uh, exercise, and it will never end. Uh, funny that. Uh, um, Musk uh, bought, uh, the purchased, uh, acquired the, the, the Twitter. He, he is very much for the uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and, uh, and he, I mean, two days later, he had to, he had to retire a little bit because, because uh, nasty things uh, were published about himself. And when it was about himself, then it turned out that he is not so uh, big fun of the of the of the of the freedom of speech. So that's that's the thing. I mean, this is a balancing exercise. You cannot say that that once for, you can solve this question once for all. That's the, I think. That's okay. but balancing exercise is a is a good thing. Uh, I think Andrea, you said that on the internet everything is is happening right now. Happening right now. You, you were the one who said that. So balancing is the law and when you want to enforce uh, freedom of speech, it must happen right here, right now. And uh, it's technicality. So for example, when the, the Christ, uh, back in the, when the Christchurch uh, shooting happened and big tech companies were trying to constantly remove uh, the shooting content from the internet, it was a, a race against time. And it, it also raises freedom of speech uh, issues, content regulation issues. But uh, the main point is that people see these contents in one or two days, then they forget about it. But uh, if you want to enforce the rights, that must happen quickly, and, uh, and that's a challenge. And you, you mentioned Musk and uh, Twitter. I think it, it will be a, um, a pretty good exercise. So I'm, 
I'm just sitting back and, and watch the show, what, what he will do. At, at, at least so, someone is trying to do something. I don't say that his agenda is good, I don't say that his agenda is bad, but uh, he will shake things, in, shake things up. It will be good to see. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we have time for a last and short uh, question, if you have. I don't see anyone from the audience, so I turn to our panelists, whether you have any closing words to say here before we close this panel. So then, in this case... <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so we have a closing uh, speech from uh, Professor Chefavari soon. Uh, but uh, by having said that, I would like to uh, thank for our panelists, uh, their active participation, their uh, presentations and answers to sometimes not easy questions. And I also would like to ask, uh, uh, thank uh, for your, audience, for your uh, uh, attention active particip participation throughout two days. So thank you very much for this. And uh, by having said that, uh, I would like uh, to pass the floor to Martin or directly to Professor uh, Chefavai. Thank, thank you very much. Just a short moderational duty. I'd like to give the floor to, to deliver our concluding remarks to Professor Zoltan Chefalvai, who's the head of the Center for Technological Futures here at MCC, and he's going to have a very uh, shaking conclusion to the conference. So thank you very much. It would be a shaking conclusion or something similar. It's a very difficult anyway to uh, be the last uh, uh, speaker. Um, I heard from my grandfather when you speak, he gave me three advice. That one is the, you stand up, everybody can watch you. Uh, second, then uh, speak loud, everybody can hear you. And be short, everybody will love you. <laughs> so I, I, I am trying that. But just coming back to the idea what you mentioned, at the, uh, Andrea, that uh, there is a learning curve and learning process in this whole exercise GDPR, uh, my students love it very much. Yeah? When they read the book of uh, Malcolm Gladwell about the learning curve, that means that when you would like to be a professional in something, you need 10,000 hours to practice. I do hope that in that case not. But the 10,000 hours means for the students, just that's a message, yeah? for 10 years, 20 hours practice, Weekly. It's good. Yeah. Um, I don't think that I can give a very comprehensive exercise in that case. Uh, maybe I would like to focus on some points. And when I am jumping, uh, that is rather because the discussion was sometimes in a jumping way. So the first question is, what the main problem is? The main problem is, I think, uh, the so-called exponential gap. We have technologies which are growing exponentially. And we have institutions which are developing linearly. Yeah. So exponentially and linearly. And there is a gap between us. Linear is something which is easy to understand for us. Our life is linear. We are born and after that go to school and well, marriage, et cetera. Yet it's how can we think. We can't really think what does it mean when something is growing exponentially? And that is a gap between the old linear thinking, old linear evolving institutions, old linear evolving law, yeah? how we regulate the economy. So that is the gap, and I think this gap was in the last two days the main important what we discussed, how to deal with this gap. We have technologies which are increasing uh, Exponentially, just uh, say one example, uh, Uber. Yeah? Uber is a very simple thing. Yeah? Has a little bit of GPS, uh, a little bit of algorithm, and has a logic, which is very simple. The more are the driver, yeah? the more smaller, will, more bigger will be the geographical coverage. So in the geographical region, more cars will be available. The faster will be the pickup time. That means there will be more demand for it. When there will be more demand for it, there will be more driver, bigger geographical coverage, shorter pickup time, and so on. 
that is a spiral. Yeah? That is the positive feedback. And when you turn something which is physical into digital, yeah, you can get grow, grow, grow exponentially yeah? and create a, a gap. It has two consequences. Yeah? One is the exponential, uh, when something is growing exponentially, uh, then the return uh, increasing at scale, which is quite new in the economy. Normally we learn, that is our industrial age and so on, uh, after a while the unit cost will uh, increase because uh, some, let's say, car producer produces, produces, after a unit it needs more organization, effort and so on, and the cost, the return of the marginal cost decreases. And it has a consequence. The consequence is, in an economy, when there is a rule decreasing return to scale, the monopolies can't grow such an ever, ever uh, speed. Now we have an economy where, uh, this is the digital economy, where we have increasing return to scale. This means when you produce something digital, yeah, to produce the second one, it costs nothing. It is just a copy of the original one. In a car manufacturing, you produce a second one, you should produce a second one. Yeah? Uh, in digital, when you have a, just a song or something, yeah, you can uh, produce as much as you want and this cost almost uh, uh, zero. So uh, these two differences, the increasing return to scale and decreasing return to scale, uh, certainly influences the monopoly position or the monopoly what we discussed also in this day. Uh, but just one point to it, how difficult to understand the exponential growth, and, uh, or I could say, how bad we are at maths. We are very good at adding, uh, adding something. But uh, it is very difficult to follow that 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 30, 2, 64, and follow, follow, follow. Yeah? So that's uh, very difficult. Just one example, I would quote uh, uh, Paul Krugman. Uh, he's a Nobel laureate economist, got the Nobel Prize 2008. But what I quote from him is uh, 1998, and it's the following. The growth of internet will slow drastically. As the flow of the Metcalf flow, which states that the number of potential connections in a network is proportional to the square of the number of participants, becomes apparent. And know the sentence, what he said. Most people have nothing to say to each other and by 2005 or so, it will become clear that the Internet's impact on the economy will have been no greater than the fax machine. Now, what happened in the meantime? He's a Nobel laureate economist. Yeah? He said, most people have nothing to say to each other. How many people are today on the Facebook? More than three billion. Uh, that's a quite different thing, what they are talking to each other. But they are talking something. And that is what I would say, how this exponential growth is even to Nobel laureate economists, it's not so easy to uh, uh, understand. Now, the problem is, as I mentioned, the exponential gap. gap. We have technologies which are growing exponentially, and we develop our, our, our institutions are evolving linear. Now, where we are, we are at the crossing of the two lines where we suddenly recognize these whole things. That is the old discussion yesterday and today about it. That no, that is one thing that uh, all technologies are developing these, but no, we recognize that something is, is not in a good shape, so we should do something. Uh, uh, that is exactly when, yeah, let's say on a good, not gloomy, but in the sunny Sunday, uh, we are having a lunch, uh, and instead of talking to each other, what we are doing, everybody is just watching the, the smartphone. And suddenly we recognize, oh, what happened with us? How on earth could it be that uh, instead of talking to each other, no, we are playing with this gadget. Exactly what, that is what we have. Crossing the two lines, we are somewhere in this uh, yeah, uh, point when it's crossed, and consider what can we do? I am not sure that, that uh, 
old and wise, what we try to do is, is in the best uh, uh, way. Um, we discussed many times the Digital Market Act. I would just quote uh, Margaret Verstager when she was appointed to a commissioner. Uh, he had a speech at the European Parliament, and I quote, following, lovely. U.S. has all the money. China has all the data, but we, in Europe, we have purpose. I don't know what purpose means, but I know that uh, currently, uh, when you look at the, the high-tech supremacy or the, or, the, or the race for high-tech supremacy is between China and U.S. and Europe is, uh, yeah, it, it, we have heard as positioning itself as a regulatory power but as not as a power in innovation. And that is a mistake. Yeah? That is the big, big problem. It's a bigger problem than the whole exponential gap. We can't live for a long time with a current situation that the innovation is, for, is uh, strongly concentrated in one country, US. And also in the US is just in few regions uh, in, the, in the world. So uh, that's. A Digital Market Act, we discussed uh, here many times uh, and from several aspects. I think one word is missing in the whole title, and that's the problem. Digital Single Market Act. The single market. Yeah? Here many, you thought about it, it is not about the single market. It is rather about, uh, to, uh, you mentioned, to avoid innovation and punishment and so on. Uh, and you quoted also uh, Paolo Cecchini with a uh, Cecchini report, what is the cost of non-Europe? Not The cost of non-Europe is not having a single market. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest benefits, I know that in, in Hungary we discussed many times uh, uh, European Union and et cetera. One of the biggest uh, advantages to be member of the European Union is the single market. And we should be very careful in that when we design the single market, it should, we don't have digital single market. And also in the single market, when you look at also the four freedoms, uh, let's say the free movement of capital people, etc., there are also some uh, uh, restrictions. So the missing word is here is the single, the digital single market act. And that is why what uh, you discussed also uh, today, um, what, 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 what does it mean uh, as a consequences? The Digital Market Act sometimes looks like how can they punish 10 companies? Yeah? Someone said, yeah? how everybody want, want to, to tax Facebook yeah? and, and, and the other. There are, I think, many other possibilities to, to tax Facebook than just to create a Digital uh, Market Act. And yeah, uh, go to the platform. We shouldn't forget that the platforms add value to the whole things. There are many transactions. They couldn't be evolved without platforms. Yeah? Uh, one presentation I think Joan uh, uh, showed here that, uh, and all my students know exactly the date. This means to uh, 2007, uh, uh, June uh, 9. Uh, 29, uh, 6 p.m. in Cupertino when uh, Steve Jobs showed, that's the iPhone here. Okay. But what really happened one year later, it was the introduction of the App Store and all these things with the apps. Yeah? And the consequence is it produced new jobs. Just in Europe, it produced more than 1.7 million new jobs. In Hungary, more than around 30,000 people are working in that. Created something, and that's the point, something from nothing. When someone would have been asked, yeah, uh, 2005, oh, what would be your dream job? Who would say, uh, yeah, app developer? No one. And that's the innovation. Yeah? And I think uh, innovation is, in my understanding, what Donald Rumsfeld said, 
the unknown unknown. You know the whole story with the known known, the known unknown, and there is an unknown unknown. We don't even know that it is possible to do that. That's the innovation. And when we have uh, uh, such a digital market act with all these restrictions, I'm a little bit afraid of that we are uh, making many constraints to discover something unknown, unknown uh, to it. Um, yeah, uh, I fully agree what has been said uh, uh, about Schumpeter and Jean Tirol was also uh, quoted. Uh, just to go back to the Jean Tirol, Jean Tirol is one of the, uh, the, the I think, the most uh, renowned scientists on uh, two-sided market platforms on anyway two-sided markets, how to uh, match them, how to let create values on both sides, both sides, and how to get both sides on the, on, on the market. And in the middle, uh, the platform gives certainly, as I mentioned, some uh, value to it. Um, there have been one word about, the, okay, how on earth could it be that these companies, uh, let's say Facebook, Google, etc., Twitter, are such a big within a short period of time? Because they are dealing with digital things. Huh? And as I mentioned, with digital, you can grow exponentially. But uh, before we uh, would engage in a strong, strong regulation, please, and, and, and also the monopoly positions, certainly the monopolies depends on on how you look the market and which market do you see. Uh, please don't forget it. Facebook and the others are teenager. Facebook was funded in 2004. The majority of my student was born in 2001. Yeah? It's teenager. What about General Electric, Rockefeller and the others? Yeah? The problem is rather different. When you look at the hundred, uh, uh, largest companies in the world, the hundred. There are some European, in, yeah? but there are also Alphabet and uh, Facebook, etc. Yeah? Uh, the European companies, there are no European companies in the hundred biggest companies in the world which is younger than 40 years. So we can complain, okay, that is, is they are growing back, growing such a fast, and, but they are young, don't forget it, they are teenagers. And when you trust Schumpeter, he was mentioned many times, don't be afraid of that. Yeah? The Schumpeterian struggle will solve all the problems, the creative uh, destructions. Uh, the problem is rather that we in Europe, we don't have such a giants. We don't have such a quick... Uh, uh, so, such a companies which are able to scale quickly, and that's the problem. There are scaling gap and many, many other uh, problem uh, with that. Um, yeah, uh, there have been many talk about the data. Um, the positive feedback is also here relatively simple. Uh, the better the product, the more will be the user. Uh, the more will be the user, the more will be the data, and the more will be the data, the more better will be the product. And we, as a consumer, we want better product. Sorry about it, but that's the life. Yeah? We want a better product. And that means in a, in a cycle, this means more data. Certainly the difficulty in, in a case, uh, uh, for a, after a certain point, to have more data, uh, then uh, the word to get more is not so relevant because uh, there's a limited uh, some, some of the data you can get good um, algorithm and so on. But in a competition situation, when you have more data than your competitor, it is certainly a better uh, point. Um, you have been talked about many times in particular in the last uh, uh, panel, data is everything, or everything is data, or how we turn everything into, I, I would rather use the term servitization, and for the servitization we use data. Uh, but 
nothing new in it. Uh, so I just quote, in the beginning there was the word, and the word was with God, yeah? in the, from the Bible. That is the first line. Yeah? All DNA is data. Yeah? Sorry about it. And we were able to sequence the DNA within a decade, and currently to sequence the DNA cost nearly nothing. So um, there are many talk about it, uh, that's uh, data, uh, how to deal with that, everything is data, and turning that. In Hungary, we many times quote it, uh, or people think they quote correctly, uh, data is the new oil. Originally, is uh, coming from Steve Hamby, He's a great mathematician, and he worked for a company, which is also in Hungary, the retail company, uh, one of the biggest chain. I don't know the name. But certainly there are some uh, parallel in this case. Yeah? Crude oil is worthless. And just to have the data without working with the data is worthless. So someone told, or you, you said in that case, that that, uh, okay, we can complain data, data, but you should work with the data. And this costs money. So please don't forget it. Platform add value. Add also value when they are working with the data. And there is one crucial difference between oil and data. When we bought this oil, but the data is the uh, new oil. Uh, when you use, refine, and use the oil, it's over. The data you can use and reuse and reuse indefinitely. Yeah? And you can build an economy which can grow exponentially. So just uh, three points, uh, because after that I think we can have some lunch or something similar. Uh, we discussed here normally the platform and digital economies and, and so on. I just raised one uh, point. Maybe it would be very interesting to think about it. The future is sometimes faster than you think. Uh, now we have cars. Around 30% of the cars is digital. Yeah? Okay. When something is digital, it can be hacked. Yeah? In the future, there will be more digital thing. Yeah? So how to deal with the problem, the data inside, yeah? in, the, in, the, in the car, when someone would like to hack our car? It is also today possible, anyway. So the best there are three solutions in, in that way. Yeah? One solution is buy a very, very old car, 30 years old. There is no electronic and, tech, and, and data inside. That is one thing. The second thing, uh, we should develop new technologies to prevent our car against the hacking. Yeah? Or we can have some kind of uh, uh, regulation, could be. Yeah. Um, just one point to the micro-targeting, profiling, and so on. As always, everything in the life is a trade-off. Yeah? Uh, it is also a trade-off uh, about privacy. Currently, privacy is uh, control over information about us. Yeah? And it is our own decision how many uh, information we would like to disclose. We charge the word of the of the service, and the cost, on that case, uh, how many information we disclose. And it is similar with the uh, profiling, uh, micro-targeting, and, and so on. Uh, because there, is a lot, there are two options in that case, when you complain, okay, and when, when I just uh, say, okay, at the weekend, I would like to have a good weekend, and after that I got some, some uh, uh, ads, uh, yeah, Budapest, Barnes, and so on. Yeah. Uh, to have a targeted, or you have a bulk of ads without targeting. It's a very annoying would be. Or there is also possibility also today that you have a search machine, not the Google, you use another, and you have to pay $6 uh, uh, a month for it. Yeah? It's your, your choice. So I think there are many possibilities, not just in the legal, but also in, in economic uh, way. So just to finish uh, this uh, uh, short uh, reflections or summary or something similar, um, I think it's very important to have such a kind of conferences. Uh, very important to understand where we are in the whole issue. 
certainly, when the two curves are in this way, we will be never, be never able to close the gap. And maybe we shouldn't close the gap. So, thank you so much. Just very briefly, I want to thank all of our panelists during the two days and our conclusions as well. We've discussed a lot about essential state functions, but I think it's time to consider essential human functions. One of such is hunger. So I want to wish everyone a bon appetit for the lunch, which is served in the lobby, and we'll meet there shortly. Thank you very much once again.